On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, did an anchor from a container ship off the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles cause the California oil spill? Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCagliano. I'm the chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science at Campbell University in beautiful North Carolina, former merchant mariner, and an instructor in courses in maritime history, maritime security, and maritime industry policy. So Southern California has a lot going on, obviously, over the past weeks in regards to maritime issues. We've got the massive amount of vessels at anchor and in the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. But over the weekend, we had an oil spill that came ashore <clears throat> at Huntington Beach and destroyed a pristine area of Southern California beaches. And the issue at stake right now is, was this caused by one of those vessels that were at anchor could have been dumped from the vessel or could have been an underwater pipeline and could one of those vessels have damaged that pipeline and that's what we're going to look at today and the possibility and the potential for that to be the case i want to thank everybody for tuning in lots of new subscribers here i really want to give a shout out to juan brown for plugging my youtube page on his youtube page i'm going to plug his in return uh, for don't for for mentioning my site and really kind of posing the question about this oil spill off the Southern California coast. So uh, this is here. This is Wolfie Corn. This is a site that actually uh, Wand recommended. Uh, great visuals here over the beach here by small aircraft over the area. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is Juan's site. He said before he mentioned my site, so I want to make sure I go ahead and plug them. And for those of you new to the site, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Be sure to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, and if at all possible, contribute to my Patreon page. That allows me to do those videos and focus on these, something I've been doing ever since Motor Vessel Ever Given has gone ashore in the Suez way back in March. And I've got quite a number of videos on the shipping situation since then that you can go back and take a look at. So let's look at this situation. So this is the report on G-Captain, Mike Schuller, who I've actually been talking to regarding this issue, uh, has this report out here. This is the latest one from today. It certainly sounds like it was a ship anchor that caused the California oil spill. And he leads out here with the new details about this. Uh, officials responded to the oil spill off the coast of Orange County, uh, California said Tuesday, the long stretch of the pipeline being investigated as the source of the spill has been displaced laterally on the sea floor. Goes down here. Uh, divers on Monday validated remotely operated vehicle footage showing no indications of oil release at the potential source of the leak. In other words, the leak has been contained. And we'll talk about what this pipeline is and why it's been tapped and, and, and closed off here. There's a unified command setup consisting of the Coast Guard, California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Office of Spill Prevention and Response, and Amplify Energy. I have to say right off the bat, there are key people missing from this and, and why they're missing from this. I don't know yet, but we'll come into that and talk about this. But this is what I want to read right here. The dive reports and RV footage show that a 4000 foot section of a 17.7 mile long pipeline was displaced with a maximum lateral movement of approximately 105 feet and a 13 inch split running parallel to the pipe. So first off, 4,000 feet, that's two thirds of a nautical mile. That's a massive section of this pipe. Uh, and, and the fact that that amount was moved and it was moved over a hundred feet indicates that this is a substantial hit to the pipeline. I just wanna read this quote here. This is from Martin Wilshire, the CEO of Amplify Energy. Amplify Energy is the energy contractor that runs this pipeline. And this is his quote directly. I'm not here to speculate about the cause. There'll be a full investigation, which will take a year or two to come out. Back to his quote. Obviously, the pipeline has been displaced. It's a 16 inch steel pipeline that's half an inch thick and covered in an inch of concrete. For it to be moved 105 feet is not common. Really? Really? That's not common. This has not been done by a Marlin. Let me be clear about this. This is a massive amount of force was exerted against this pipeline to move it that amount of distance. And there's very few things that could have done this. Let's be clear. Earthquake obviously could have done it, but there's no register of an earthquake. Uh, again, this, this leak only started on Friday. The response kicked off on Saturday. And again, here we are on Tuesday, just getting our, our, our arms around this. And we're seeing the damage along the beaches of Southern California. 
goes on here. Uh, there's a few other stories that that's in here on GCAP. And officials looking to whether a ship's anchor may have caused a leak. This is a Bloomberg story. This is from yesterday coming out. And this was, I think, the initial story that comes out here. Uh, oh, this is uh, about the, again, the, the escalating amount of vessels that are coming into Southern California. This is from the Southern California Spill Response. This is the unified team that's out here with their updates going in. And you see the updates here by Unified Command right here. They had a press conference today, which, by the way, if you're going to run a press conference for these things, have decent audio quality. Seriously, people. I, I, I mean, I don't understand why every time that there is an incident of an accident of any kind, the audio quality for these things are horrible and you can barely hear anything. As of October 5th at 7 a.m., Nearly 5,000 gallons of crude oil has been recovered. Estimated 15.67 miles of light oiling was reported along the shoreline. Six miles of shoreline has been cleaned and crews continue uh, cleanup efforts. Seven aircraft are assigned with 14 flights scheduled for Tuesday. 11,360 feet of containment boom has been deployed. Eight oiled wildlife have been recovered. I'm not, again, this is the ducks and pelicans and everything they start getting out. 328 personnel deployed cause of the spill remains under investigation the owner of this pipeline is amplify energy and we're going to go into some detail here and talk about this so let me first talk about strikes underwater by vessels this is not uncommon unfortunately this this actually happens quite a bit one of the things we've seen over the past just few years is quite a number of times ships anchor and the anchors will impinge on objects on the bottom of the ocean. Don't think for a second the bottom of ocean is a clean thing that there's nothing there. There's actually quite a lot at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the one thing that in particular gets hit a lot are these things, and these are submarine cables. This is from submarinecablemap.com. It's a great site. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, shows you all underwater cables. The bottom of the ocean is littered with underwater cables. If you use your cell phone to call somebody, I call my buddy in Australia right now, I'm in North Carolina. The only wireless part, the only part that's actually not on a wire is from my phone to the cell phone tower that's about two miles away from me. That hooks into a cable. That cable goes across the country. It goes underwater all the way to Australia, to Sydney. And then his phone call is ringed by a, by a, a, a cable that's looked to a cell phone tower that's linked to his phone. The, the entire wireless element of here is just a few miles, really. The rest of it is done by cable. It's not satellites. It's not what everybody thinks. And one of the things we've seen is submarine cables getting hit. So for example, right here, zoom in here for a second. This is the island of Tonga. You'll see right here, there's Tonga right there. Tonga is fed by a single internet cable. Well, a few years ago, Tonga lost uh, uh, its internet connection 11 days because of an anchor, because of a ship's anchor pulling up on this. And the 11,000 residents in, uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, for 11 days, the citizens of Tonga uh, we, were without their internet. Now, we've seen even larger ones that happen. Uh, Dubai, for example, got it a few years ago. 75 million people lost their internet when a ship's anchor went down. And this actually story actually talks about three underwater cables in the Mediterranean and the Middle East that cut off internet connection. And it, it, it's a big issue. Underwater cables provide a huge amount of information around the world. Uh, it was also very key during the Cold War for the US to tap those underwater cables to be able to read what the Soviets were doing. If, 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 if again, I embark on my uh, lifelong desire to become a pirate, uh, I would not pirate ships. I'd pirate submarine cables, I'd tap submarine cables, and get all that information out there in the middle of the international oceans where there's no law whatsoever. But the other element that's underwater is distribution pipelines for oil and natural gas. And we have two examples of those that we've seen that have been pretty, pretty substantial uh, not too long ago. So earlier this year, I did a pair of videos on this. This was a massive fire out in the Gulf of Mexico, what's called a fire eye, uh, a natural gas pipeline underwater cracked, fractured, and started leaking natural gas to the surface, bubbled to the surface, ignited, and created a fire on the ocean surface. Absolutely surreal uh, uh, creation. Now, this was not caused by a ship anchor. This was caused by a fracture in the pipeline. We're not exactly sure what caused it. Later on, this same area right here, this, this, this oil facility in the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Mexico, had a fire on board. Uh, several people died. 
But the one I want to show you is this one. This is the, the story of the ever judger. This is a bulker off Indonesia in 2018. And uh, this bulk ship basically had an issue on board. Uh, it talks about it right here. On March 31st, 2018, the vessel damaged a pipeline, which caused an oil spill and a fire that claimed five local fishermen's lives, as well as causing environmental damage. The, the bulk carrier caught fire before dawn. The vessel's anchor became stuck on an underwater oil pipe in the Bal Balapapan Bay. The pipe later broke before the anchor pulled it because the, the anchor pulled, excuse me, the line was found about 300 feet from its original position alongside a 500 long pharaoh in the seabed. And the ever judger was the only vessel in the vicinity. This, this oil got to the surface, it ignited, engulfed some fishing boats, and as I mentioned before, killed five of, of fishermen. Uh, the, the captain of the vessel was jailed for 10 years as a result of this. So it was a pretty substantial issue. So we've seen ship's anchors cut submarine cables, cut underwater cables, cut basically pipelines. So that is a definitive possibility. The question now is, could one of the vessels off the coast of LA and Long Beach have done that? And that's what we're going to look at right now. So if you've been following me at all, and or if you're new to the channel, one of the sites I love to use is marinetraffic.com. Marine Traffic basically tracks all commercial vessels in the world that are squawking in AIS, an automated information system. This is Southern California right now. Uh, the green vessels represent cargo ships, red are tankers. And if you come down here, this is the massive anchorage that's off LA and Long Beach. And you'll see it right here. You'll see that anchorage right here. I'm going to come out here for a minute because I want to zoom out for a minute. So one of the things you'll notice is a batch of green vessels off, uh, off Catalina Island right here. These are in the drift area right here. There's so many vessels that need to get into LA and Long Beach. We're talking about 60, 70 vessels. I forget what the exact count is today. But some of them are drifting off of Catalina right now. So they're basically just drifting. They're not anchored because actually the water's too deep. It's a huge ledge out here, which is something we'll talk about. They can't anchor because it's just too deep. So what they do is they just basically turn their engines, stop spinning the props, and they're underway, but not making way. They're drifting. And so they're drifting here off Catalina. Now, when you come in close to LA and Long Beach, understand LA and Long Beach usually have maybe one anchor, ship at anchor at a time. Usually if a ship gets in late, uh, it'll anchor here in the anchorage just off the breakwater for LA Long Beach. This is LA Long Beach right here. LA on the left, Long Beach on the right. There are uh, areas in the breakwater right here. This is the breakwater into LA, the breakwater into Long Beach over here. And then this is Long Beach all right here. This is all LA right here. And these are the vessels out in the anchorage. So let me show you something that, that stands out here. There's three actually anchorages out here. So there's, there's the one anchorage right here, which is really for the port of LA. There's Long Beach right over here. And then there's this secondary anchorage that's down over here. And these anchors here are oil platforms. These are the oil platforms that are out here right now. And there is a pipeline that runs between these two right here. And I'm going to show you another site. This is Marine Waves. So Marine Waves is a great app if you want to download an app. If you're ever on a boat along coastal waters of the United States and you want the charts and, and, and maps, Marine Waves is the way to go. I use this all the time. So this is Marine Waves right here. Depth is in feet right here. So I, I set it so the depth's uh, showing feet. Sometimes you'll see it in fathoms. Sometimes you'll see it in meters. This is feet. So you'll see feet. And again, here are those, those oil platforms right here. Here are those oil platforms right here. And if you zoom in just a little bit right here, you'll see the pipelines. Those are the pipelines. So this is Edith. This is Eve right here. Come back over here. This is Edith right here. This is Eve right here. So that pipeline runs right along here. Now, one of the pieces of information we're not getting from the Unified Command is where this break is. And more importantly, which way was the pipeline dragged? Was it dragged north? Was it dragged south, east, west? Which way was it gone? Because that's really important to get us an idea of what vessel did this and where's the break. I mean, if the break's over here, there's very unlikely that this is one of these vessels over here. I, I'm assuming the break is right in here somewhere. This is where we're assuming this break to be. And if you looked at some satellite photos that had the oil spill out here, it looked like it was right around here somewhere. So come back over here. This shows you those pipelines. And if you zoom out of your or actually we can't zoom out because you lose the pipeline. Comes into Ava here and then it goes ashore. Same thing. This one goes ashore. And then this pipeline goes up and hooks hard to the left there. And you'll see it. This area right here is clear. So this is one of the reasons why you have this break right here between this. 
The other issue you have here that's really important, I'm going to zoom out here a little bit here, is this. Go out here just a little bit more to get a better image of it here. Is this. This shallow water area. This is a ledge right here. This is the ledge that the, that the anchorages are on. You have to be within a certain depth to anchor a vessel. Uh, to anchor a vessel, and I even broke into my old books, kind of got out my old uh, book here on uh, uh, ship handling for the mariner. It was a really old book. And look at how much anchor chain you need to have out. Now, understand ships have a limited number of anchor chain. And one of the big misconceptions out there is a ship anchoring. Let me give you the, the image here. I think I got an image here for you. Know that one, this one. So one of the things that, that's important to understand is when ships anchor, and I'm talking large ships. I'm not talking about your little boat or anything with, with an anchor and a rope on it. I'm talking about anchor with a chain on it. The thing that holds the vessel in place, believe it or not, is not the anchor. It's the anchor and the chain. The chain has to be laid out. And when you lay an anchor from a vessel, if you've ever seen uh, uh, below decks on, on Bravo, for example, they'll, they'll drop their anchor all the time and they let it go and it, boom, it hits the bottom. What they don't ever show you is when you drop your anchor and it goes straight down, you back away from it and you lay your chain out and you have to lay the chain. And usually the chain's anywhere between two to five times the depth of the water because the chain and the anchor is what holds you. And so one of the things you'll do is lay out shots of chain. A shot of chain is 90 feet is 90 feet, 15 fathoms. That's that's what you do. So depending on the depth of your water, go back over to here for a second. Let's zoom in here for a second. So, I mean, if you're in this anchorage over here, for example, if you look at this anchorage right over here, you're talking about 96 feet, 60 feet, 80 feet, 70 feet. If, if we just round it, let's just say it's, a, let's say it's 100 feet, just for something very easy to do. 100 feet, then you would have to lay out two to five times that. You have to lay out from 200 to 500 feet of chain to do that 90 feet. So you're talking about, you know, if it's 200 feet, you're talking at least two shots up to maybe almost five shots of chain. If you're over here where it's, you know, 60 and 70 feet, not as much, but understand when you lay this anchor chain out, your vessel swing on that anchor chain. These are container ships, container ships. When the wind gets going, will swing on that anchor and vessels swing at that anchor. And you have to have an anchor an anchor swing area from the where the anchor is on the bottom to the stern of your vessel. So if you lay out 300 feet of chain and your vessel is 900 feet long, you need a 1200 foot swing area to make sure that nothing comes in it. So it takes a lot of space to anchor these vessels out. They can't anchor very close because you don't want vessels swing into each other. Even though these are container ships, different ships swing different ways. So you need that kind of space between everybody to get it. This is a great site right here. I, a friend of mine works for Bo, uh, BOEM. And BOEM is one of these entities that's not talked about here in any of these stories so far. BOEM is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is basically the ones who take care of underwater pipelines for the US government. They're the ones who get permits. They're the ones who who, who permit uh, uh, drilling platforms. They allow the laying of, of underwater pipelines. Uh, my friend is an underwater archeologist. One of the things that before they lay a pipeline is they got to survey the land to make sure there's no wrecks, for example, or, or historical sites that'll be damaged. And that's what she does for BOEM. And amazingly, again, BOEM hasn't been mentioned in this at all. And understand, this is, if it's a pipeline, this is federal, this is not state. I, I, I'm not exactly sure where BOEM is, is on this yet, but they really need to be involved because if you've moved a pipeline, that, that's a federal issue right there. And they're the ones who should be involved. So this is their site. This is the Marine Cadastre. Cadastre? I'm not sure how they say that. Uh, uh, National Viewer. And I want to use this site because it's really fantastic. I got to say, I, I'm so happy. Uh, I, I, I know people. And so here is it. And you can really see the ledge right there. You can see the drop off here into San Pedro channel right here, the San Pedro Escarpment. And remember, California is basically a mountain range just shoved up. Again, go back to your tectonic plates and you know the, the fiery circle around the Pacific. And you have a very little narrow ledge here with San Pedro Bay. And so one of the things I want to show you here is you can pop in here. There's your drilling platforms right there. Those are the three drilling platforms that are out there, right there at the edge right there. And one of them kind of off on the deep side. If we come down here a little bit, we can pull up the pipelines. Come down here. Again, you can lug. I mean, there's plenty of, uh, of, of things you can 
get in here and I hadn't even started playing with this and I'll have all these links for you. So you can go in here. Let's see, let's get the pipeline areas in here. So we're going to see the pipeline areas. Let's see. And everything. Let me pull up one other one. Here it is selected pipelines. So here's that pipeline. This is obviously the pipeline that has been cut. And again, if you come back over here to marine traffic, you'll see right where that is coming from this platform right here, going to this platform right there. And you can see it kind of moving out here. And the other thing that this really allows you to do here, one of the other things all the way up here at the very beginning, sorry, at the very beginning here, is they allow you to use AIS traffic where vessels are and, and how they're basically going in here. So you can pull up, for example, right here, AS Transit. So here's the transits in 2020. And you'll see how little transited this area is. And especially even right here, there's that connection right there. Here's the pipeline right here. You can see it going that way. You can see where this is very little traffic over here around this area of the pipeline. Again, come back over to here. Very little area. I mean, there's almost this, this is the unusual thing. Again, you don't have vessels typically anchoring out here. There's one to two vessels maybe anchored off LA at one time. You have to go back to 2015 with the labor strikes to get vessels anchored out here. So could a vessel have struck that anchor and I or struck the pipeline? And I gotta say yes, right off the bat, obviously. Because of the unusual fact that you have vessels anchoring in areas they don't typically anchor, then yes, that is completely plausible. And based on the description of the fact that the pipeline's been 400, 4,000 feet of it have been moved. It's been moved 105 feet. There's a gash in it. Yeah, it could be. It may not be the anchor. It could have been the chain cutting across it. There's no telling who could have you know, been involved in that. And that comes to the question, why? Why was nobody thinking about this as an issue? You're going to anchor vessels where there's an underwater pipeline and Who's telling these vessels to anchor here? Who's in charge of this? And that's the other question that really needs to be addressed at this time. Because again, we're not seeing anybody stepping up here to say anything. Again, no one has said a ship has done this yet. And there's a lot of questions about what ship did it. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. So who's in charge? Well, you have a couple of entities that are in charge here that you need to know who they are. So the first thing is the Maritime Exchange of Southern California. So the Maritime Exchange of Southern California, this is their website. I pulled it up for everybody. And I, again, will have all these in the show notes. 90 plus year old nonprofit organization dedicated to development and efficient flow of maritime commerce through the region. They provide a continuous 24 hour service, use a state of the art, comprehensive computerized database system to provide vital statistics and information on ships calling at the four major ports in Southern California, Port, Port Wainimi, Los Angeles, Long Beach, and San Diego, and the Marine Oil Terminal at El Segundo. So the Marine Exchange is one of these. And because of the nature of the ports here, you have the Port of LA and Long Beach, you have the Marine Exchange overseeing it. So you've got the Port of LA, that's one. Port of Long Beach, that's another. You have the Marine Exchange. All right. Who else is involved in this? Well, there are some elements of this that you need to understand that also play a part so one of the things they have set up under the Marine Exchange of Southern California is the Harbor Safety Committee. The, and they're under contract from the Office of Spill Prevention and Response to serve as the Executive Secretariat for the LA Long Beach Harbor Safety Committee. The Harbor Safety Committee is responsible for planning, providing for safe navigation and operation of all vessels operating within San Pedro Bay. Now, this is the area we're talking about here. That, that, this is San Pedro Bay. This flat shelf right here, this is it. You can see it right here. Take that out right there. So get rid of that there. This is San Pedro Bay, the anchorage here. That's what we're talking about right here. This is the area of San Pedro Bay. Uh, Los Angeles Long Beach Port Complex and to address the prevention of oil spills and other mishaps that can endanger, pollute the harbors, channels, coastal waters within its defined geographic boundary. Where is the Marine Exchange on this? <laughs> because they are one of them who are sitting there saying this is their job to make sure this happens. And to make sure this happens, they have several entities that do this. So one of the things that's set up here is what's called a vessel traffic scheme or vessel traffic scheme, uh, vessel traffic separation scheme. So VTS, which is very similar, if you ever watch any airline movie or any any movie, if you ever watched, uh, you know how airplanes come into airports, they're directed by radars. They're telling them come left, come right, you know, do all this stuff. 
Ships don't always have that, but in some ports you do. And in the port of LA and Long Beach, you do. You have this vessel traffic separation scheme. You have it in, in New York. A lot of major ports will have this. And there are lanes you come in. There are lanes like there are in highways, but they're not as rigid as highways. You can cross over them. So there's this northern lane that comes from Santa Cruz Island through the Santa Barbara Channel toward the LA Long Beach area. There's the southern lane that heads southward, and then there's a western lane that heads out. But more importantly, there's the anchorages. Now, this vessel, this VTS system is very unique in Southern California because it's the only privately run VTS there is in the United States. All the rest are typically run by the Coast Guard. And one of the things that I pulled up here is the user guide for the vessel traffic scheme. This is it. This is their pamphlet they have. It's on their site. You can pull it up. And one of the things it does is it talks about what to do when you're inbound. You know, you call the Vessel Traffic Center on, on VHF. This is the radios they have, Channel 14. Call San Pedro Traffic. You give them information. You're provided ETA and everything. Uh, you're contacted by them. Uh, and then they'll give you directions. They'll give you directions. Now, you, typically, you come in, you meet your pilot, and you come inbound. But as the case with LA and Long Beach right now, as one of my other videos talks about, is is we have way too many ships for a variety of reasons. Again, you can go look at this video and, and, and it'll have a whole batch of information on that. But it puts you into this anchorage. It puts you in the anchorage. The question is, who's setting up those anchorages? Are they telling you a latitude and a longitude, a specific position, go drop your anchor? Or are they telling you, go to this area and find a spot? That's the question we need to find out. The other problem we have here, again, this is the anchorages right here. This is from their manual. This is their Anchorage's manuals. The, the Anchorage Management Guidelines this chapter of the operating procedures stands to care for LA Long Beach. Vessels at anchor shall observe all port tariffs and Coast Guard regulations. It goes in here. General anchoraging guidelines outside the federal breakwater. So federal breakwater, that's this breakwater right here. That's outside the breakwater. This is what creates the, the safe harbor of LA and Long Beach. So what what... They have to do BTS manages and monitors the anchors outside the federal breakwater. Six in the Gulf area, 16 in Foxtrot, three in the South Foxtrot area. And if you look at this, this is Gulf. They said, uh, so I'm sorry, was it uh, 16 in Foxtrot? This is Foxtrot and this is South Foxtrot. Now, number one, way over the number of the anchorages right here. Just go back into this again. Six in Gulf, three in South Foxtrot. Well, no, there's there's two, four, six, eight, nine in South Foxtrot right now. So you're over the anchorages right there. And one of the questions that needs to be asked is who surveyed these additional anchorages? Where is that specific boundary set by those anchorages? There should be bounds for those anchorages. Lots of times they'll give you set anchorages with latitudes and longitudes, and that's where you anchor within your circle, your swing circle. You drop your anchor within there. That doesn't seem to be clearly delineated here. Uh, it goes on here. Any vessel want to use one of these an anchorages shall advise the VTS and be assigned an anchorage by the VTS. So the vessel traffic system assigns you your anchorage. That means the Marine Exchange and the captain of the port, who's a U.S. Coast Guard. This VTS system is done in conjunction with the U.S. Coast Guard. And just to be clear, the Coast Guard is investigating this event. So if there's a conflict of interest, there is, then the Coast Guard should not be involved in this because they have responsibility for assigning these anchorages. And if a vessel was in the right anchorage or not in the right anchorage, they need to be there. goes on, the VTS will not provide shoreside radio direction during anchoring. However, VTS will offer on request latitude and longitude or range and bearings from either Los Angeles Light or Long Beach Light. Uh, so they'll give you where to go, where to be, but one of the things they talk about is they're not going to monitor you in the anchorage. They're not going to sit there and say, you're in the wrong spot. You're not in the wrong spot. It's up to you. And that may be fine when it's routine business. This is not routine business. There needed to be a change in operating procedures here. And there may be. But again, the Coast Guard is not talking. The Marine Exchange is not talking. I watched the press conferences, all, all of them, and they're not saying anything. And somehow one of these vessels struck that struck that pipeline. That's the anchorages right there. This right here is the vessel traffic service. This is the agreement right here that we talked about before. Public-private partnership 
for the ports of LA Long Beach. It's jointly operated and managed by the Marine Exchange of Southern California and the Coast Guard captain of the port. So that this right here in their own documents of the Marine Exchange are identifying who's in charge of assigning these anchorages, who's supposed to be in the anchorages, and where those anchorages are supposed to be. And if a vessel has hit this, this pipe in any way, then we need to know. So obviously the question becomes now, what vessel did this? What vessel was responsible for this? And if you look at this map, uh, we've got a couple of vessels in the area right here. Uh, two of them in particularly the MSC Aries and the CMCGM Panama have been basically identified as potential vessels that have been doing this. Uh, this is this uh, MSC uh, Aruga. She basically got in here at the anchorage on September 26th. I, I mean, unlikely she hasn't moved. So not really clear it's going to be her. This is the CMA, CGM, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. She got in on the 29th. She's sitting in there. Hyunda Prestige is out here. She's been in here at, since September 28th. Uh, a lot of these vessels have been here for a while. Again, MSC Aries here since September 29th. CMCGA Panama, she's been there since September 26th. Now, the vessel of question that everybody wants to talk about right now is this ship right here. And this is a ship that left and is en route to Oakland right now. And that's the Rotterdam Express. So this is her. I'll give you her live position right now. And again, this is marine traffic. Great. Uh, just a absolutely fantastic. I love playing with this thing. I could do this all day long. So here's the Rotterdam Express heading up into uh, San Francisco. She's actually heading to Oakland right now. She left Long Beach on October 4th. And one of the things we're going to do is pull back. This is her track. This is her coming out of Long Beach right here. And she did go into Long Beach. So let's see. Here's, here she is in Long Beach. Now, this doesn't look like a very damning track at all because, again, she came out of Long Beach. Here's the other vessels over here. But what we can do here is pull up her track. Let's pull her track up from October 3rd. Let's pull it up at midnight. Okay. And one of the things we're going to do is go look at her. Here she is right here. You'll see her. Let's see if we can pull her up here. Here she is. So here's, here is a Rotterdam Express right here. And unfortunately, it gets rid of the other vessels and everything in here. But if you look where she is, I'll pull this out a little bit right here. You can see where San Pedro is. You can see where Huntington Beach is right here. And basically, she's right in this area right around here. And again, if you zoom in here, that's close to where these pipelines are. She's pretty close to where that area is. And we're going to fast forward this a bit. Let that run a little bit. This is uh, giving you times October 3rd, uh, 9. 10 a.m., 11 a.m. This is usually on uh, Greenwich Mean Time, I believe it is, or Universal Standard Time. So that's uh, eight hours, I think, uh, 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 California ahead. And there she goes off. She's in Long Beach for a couple of days. Again, that was on October. Let's, let's pause that for a second. So this is on the 3rd. She's coming out. You can see her coming out. Now, when ships pull up their anchor, go on the reverse of what we talked about earlier here. When, 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 when ships pull up their anchor, one of the things they're going to do is try to be at the end of their chain. They want to stretch their chain out long. And so one of the things they'll do is back down, stretch the chain out so that when, then what they can do is start hauling up on the chain, coming forward on the vessel, hauling the chain. You don't want the chain on top of each other or get tangled. And even big, huge, massive anchor chain can get tangled. So you want to stretch it out. And so sometimes ships will pull out on that chain and, and stretch it out. Now, I, I saw a report saying that the ship got underway really quick because she wanted to make the berth. She is not in Long Beach very long. Again, this is October 3rd at 610. Again, we're, we're talking about this at, 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 at different times here. So, I mean, you see her getting underway. She heads in. She's right in there around 2,200 hours. Uh, she's in very quickly in in the port of Long Beach. I mean, she's not in there very long. Again, there's a big rush to rotate vessels in and out. There is a, a rapidity here that that needs to get these vessels out as, as quickly and, and, and fast as we can. And so one of the questions we have is, was the Rotterdam Express, you know, upping anchor and not doing the proper safety that needs to be done? And then there she is heading out on her way up to Oakland at that point. So. 
a lot of issues at play here. Uh, do I know that it's the Rotterdam Express? No, I don't. Do I know it's a ship that did it? I don't. Based on what we're hearing and based on the damage, it sounds like an anchor. It sounds like someone hooked that thing and dragged it 4,000 feet of it, 105 foot displacement and put a 13 foot gash in it. Uh, hard to think what else that can be beyond, you know, a submarine, which it's not going to be, uh, or, you know, the, the most horrendous sea creature the world has ever seen, unless we're doing, you know, Pacific Rim. I don't think so. So lot to look at here. Uh, don't know. One of the things I have a problem with all the time with these investigations is it's fine not to make a conclusion, but what do we think it is? It's obviously something. And the other question is, why did they let Rotterdam Express leave? She's just heading up to Oakland. Uh, did they question the crew? Was there any information about this? I, I mean, there should have been somebody who asked them. I don't know if they did or they didn't. They're not saying yet. Hopefully, we'll find more information about it. So anyway, I hope you like the video. I know it's a little bit longer than I wanted to go. I apologize. Uh, but a lot of information to go in. I'll have all the links in the video there for you. If you enjoyed this video, uh, and I know if you're in Southern California, you don't enjoy this video because of the oil leakage. And I am so sorry about that. Any any environmental de disaster is absolutely horrific. And uh, my, my deepest sympathies go out to the citizens down there who have to suffer from this. And there's no reason they should have done. And I, let me mention one other thing, because I, I'm gonna, I, I meant to do this earlier, and I'm going to mention it right now. I did a video about who should be in charge of the maritime crisis we're facing. And here's a perfect example of that. Who should be in charge of this maritime crisis? Uh, you had this unified command structure in there with California Wildlife, the oil company, and the US Coast Guard. Where's BOEM? They should be there. They, they, they have to be there. It's pipelines. They need to be there. They know pipelines. Where's the Maritime Administration? The U.S. Maritime Administration is supposed to oversee all maritime activities of the United States. Where is the Maritime Administration? Again, we do not have a permanent Maritime Administrator. 260 days of this administration. I'm not picking on Biden. I don't care what, I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat. Appoint a Maritime Administrator. We need someone to oversee the biggest shipping crisis this country has faced since World War II. Not only do you have this crisis going on, you've got the port congestion going on. We have a port czar, where's the port leader? We've appointed someone to be port czar, where is he? Uh, is this LA and Long Beach fault? Are they pushing the schedule so much that ships are taking these risks? We need to look at the port of LA and Long Beach. Uh, where, where is the temporary maritime? Where's the Secretary of Transportation, Secretary Buttigieg? Where are you? This is transportation. This is commerce. This is interior. I mean, there's a whole batch of issues at play here. And someone needs to get control of this situation. Because again, one of the dangers we see is this spiraling out of control. I, I mean, if, if, if we're taking risks here, and that's where maritime disasters happen, people are taking shortcuts, they're taking risks, they're getting fast, they're getting sloppy, they're not doing what they need to do. If we're just dropping anchors everywhere without the proper guidance, then that's a problem. And if there was proper guidance, then maybe we're not monitoring these pipelines good enough because it's shifted, it's moved. Well, I don't know. I mean, how can any ship get within that close to a pipeline and not raise a red flag? And again, if it's not a pipeline, I mean, it's not an anchor, then this is for naught. But everything in it is indicating that we need to have clarity in our maritime policy, and we don't. The Maritime Administration, the Federal Maritime Commission, you've got an allegation of assault and, and, and rape on board vessels uh, of female cadets from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Again, where is the representation from the maritime community? Seriously, where is it? Because it needs to be out there. I'm an outsider. I'm an academic. I'm tenured. I can say whatever I want. Uh, I'm outside. I can critique this. I can say it. I'm not a journalist. Uh, I have no benefits in this from shipyards, from shipping companies, from anybody. And so I'm going to give you what I think needs to be done. There needs to be appointed a maritime administrator that can go in and deal with all these issues and appoint people to look over this. Someone needs to be looking at what's happening in the ports, not just regard movement of cargo, but the movement of vessels and the, the just the critical feature of, of, of shortcuts that are seen to be taken here. So I don't mean to be critical, but I am, and I'm fine with that. So anyway, if you enjoyed the video, hit subscribe, hit the bell, please share, leave a comment. Uh, I appreciate again, everybody who's uh, new on board. And thank you again for recommending my website. Uh, it means a lot. 
Uh, please follow me on YouTube. And if you can contribute to the Patreon page, that allows me to free up time for my other schedule. So I don't have to teach extra classes and I can focus on this. So anyway, so the next video, Sal signing off.